For those of you who don't know, I'm John Stevens. I'm director of the Center for European Studies and the European Union, Union Center uh, here at UNC. We're located about downstairs in this corner. Uh, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to uh, a talk by Ambassador Roman Kern, who is uh, the ambassador of Slovenia to the United States. Uh, and he's here partly in conjunction with the concert tonight by the European Union uh, Youth Orchestra. Of course, Slovenia is a uh, European Union member, and uh, so I guess in part I should welcome both the Youth Orchestra and the ambassador here on the part of the European Union Center. Um, Mr. Kern was appointed ambassador to, uh, of Slovenia to the United States on May 26 of 2009. Uh, he most recently served as director of the Department for North and Latin America and the Caribbean for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia uh, and head of transatlantic relations and preparations uh, of the EU-US summit during Slovenia's European Union presidency in June of 2008. Uh, before that, 2002 to 2006, he was um, also Slovenia's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, during which time he was vice president of the UN General Assembly, vice president of the 2005 N NPT Review Conference, among other positions. Before that, 2000 to 2002, he was ambassador and permanent representative to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. So I'd like to thank, uh, welcome the ambassador, and at least this piece of paper says the title is going to be Slovenia and the EU uh, in the global world 20 years later. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. I, I really wish to thank to Professor Stevens and Edwards to invite me here and uh, to share a few moments with you. I must admit it's my, it's my first time uh, here in North Carolina and uh, I'll be looking forward for the rest of the day uh, as uh, I always learn uh, when while traveling and uh, I'm keen to learn more about uh, North Carolina. It's uh, on, in our job description to learn about the country as much as possible. And uh, I can tell you, had, you, you have a huge country. <laughs> uh, 50 states. EU has only 27, so we have a long way to catch up, to catch up uh, with you. Uh, I, uh, yeah, we, we provided uh, you with, with some title of my lecture, but I always try to respond maybe to, to the specific uh, environment or expectation that, that there may be. So with your indulgence, maybe I will uh, depart a little bit on that subject. Uh, but definitely I would like to talk to you about European Union and uh, about uh, Slovenia. Now, uh, when when Mr. Edwards turned me around, I I saw that uh, you are quite well equipped, not in, only in terms of literature, but uh, also in terms of knowledge about European Union. So, I guess uh, I can learn something from you. Uh, what, what would be interesting to me really is to see your perspective of European Union uh, that I can take with me as I will share with you my, my perspective. I have been in, uh, in foreign service for quite some time, already in times of uh, former Yugoslavia, and uh, I can tell you those were moments that I haven't had the pleasure of talking about Slovenia as much as I have now. So, again, with your indulgence, you will allow me to say a few words also about Slovenia. So, we, when we travel, as we consider ourselves also EU ambassadors, when we travel in the States, that's some kind of a tacit agreement among EU ambassadors, we are encouraged to talk about EU. And we do that with great pleasure, because this is something that we share 
which is not something that is imposed on us that we should talk about EU. We talk about EU because we want that you understand better the, the way that, that EU operates. So what we do, uh, 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 EU member ambassadors, uh, is that we talk about 80% of EU and 20% about our national countries, which is a fair deal, because I, I believe that I, I need to say a few words also about Slovenia. After all, it's, it's all the way a new country for, for you. It's, uh, it, it has been last year only 20 years old, and this year, just last week, 20 years since the United States recognized new entity in, in this part of Europe. And of course, that was critical for us then to be fully admitted, what we say, to the international community. Without that, uh, of course, any state host is, is imperfect, uh, no, no doubt. Now, uh, as uh, when we follow the, the headlines in the newspapers, when we watch TV, we are so often pressed by the current events that are happening daily on the ground. Uh, that out of these pressing issues daily, we tend sometimes to lose out of the picture the, 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 the reasoning behind the, the, true, the, the true developments that are trying to, or that may help us to understand what is going today. And at the same time, with this haste to to have a sense of direction, sometimes we, we expect that certain developments will go faster than objectively it is possible to, to, to do so. And for that reason, we may be critical of the current stage that we find ourselves. I will try to explain you what, what I think about that, because when why, when reading the headlines, I often, I often see critical notes on EU related to Euro crisis, that Euro is going to fail, that even EU is not going to survive, uh, here and there, catastrophic scenarios, and uh, some uh, critics that uh, are based on the current difficulties, but not understanding the historical <coughs> context within which certain developments uh, take place. So for that reason, it is good to have understanding of uh, what is going on in Europe uh, today. And uh, to, to understand that, uh, let me, allow me to go a little bit uh, back, and that I, I will include Slovenia, because Slovenia uh, is a part of this uh, new development in Europe. Slovenia is a product of, a, of a historical changes that has happened uh, in, in Europe uh, 20 or so years ago. Uh, but let's try to share with you what, what, what put Slovenia on the map. I'm, I, I'm not sure how many are that familiar with the European history. I can only tell you that Slovenia is a really old nation, but very, very young country. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, witnessed uh, certain historical processes in Europe which brought gradually our statehood uh, to the surface. There were new states coming to the surface uh, after the First World War, as you know. Uh, two big empires collapsed, Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Slovenia was in that part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, at that time, Slovenians, they, they had an option. While living for over 600 years under Habsburgs, there was, you know, some, in some corners, some, some desire why we should not then join to Austria as after, you know, after uh, the First World War, Austria appeared as a democratic, uh, attractive, attractive state. 
And uh, that character of that new Austria convinced a good portion of Slovenes living nowadays in Carinthia through a referendum to opt for Slovenia. But I'm trying to portray you the situation where the whole nation of Slovenes was waiting which way to go. We opted then to be part of the Slavic community, which was uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, I would dare to say that was a good decision because that community, through its constitutional arrangement later on, uh, later on, of course, uh, enabled for Slovenes to preserve its identity. And that's always critical for nation of size of, of uh, Slovenia. So we, our identity was preserved in the community of Yugoslav nations. Now the second big wave of uh, new states then uh, happened uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall with the democratization that embraced uh, a good part of uh, so-called New Europe or Eastern Europe and Central Europe. Uh, and a certain degree also South, Southeast Europe, but that democratization process in Southeast Europe uh, went at a very slow pace. And uh, that was also the reason, basically, why uh, Yugoslavia as a multinational state collapsed, or it was simply disintegrated. Uh, because simply it was not capable to manage the, the numerous diversity uh, that were embodied into this entity of Yugoslavia as a community of uh, six republics, five nations, with uh, three religions, uh, 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 three languages, two alphabets, you name it. So it was uh, quite quite difficult to manage, but the distinctive uh, development in comparison with other countries that uh, entered the path of democratization was that these countries fully embraced the new political environment to democratize themselves. While Yugoslavia was, you know, hesitant and uh, in Yugoslavia at large, unfortunately, instead of democracy, nationalism prevailed. And that led to some violent conflict that led no other options but for, for this uh, multinational state to, to, to disintegrate. And uh, just uh, to make a, a sense of the dynamic of history, uh, I would just like to, to portray you the picture then of only the last uh, 20 years when even some high politician in the United States, they said 20 years ago and a uh, few weeks, that Slovenia will never survive. That, you know, it is not suggested that it would embark on the way of its own independence. Uh, and uh, to have the situation then that uh, not long afterwards, in 2008, Slovenia was in the chairmanship of the European Union. So between 92 and 2008, certain years, uh, well, 16 years or so, Slovenia was in the chairmanship of the European Union of 500 million dollars, 500 million inhabitants. Now that is, that is just to illustrate the, the sense of dynamics that has happened uh, in, in, the last, uh, in the last 20 years. And uh, that sense of dynamic is, as it was relevant for countries of Slovenia, it was relevant also for EU. Now, when I referred to, to this uh, notion of not understanding properly the, the, the course of development at a given moment, I had in mind precisely the process of the European integration. Uh, because we tend to be quite critical in Europe, but 
very much also in the United States on the on the pace and the stage of this integration that that uh, that that we that we are a part of. Uh, but uh, we we have to put uh, EU integration in, in the historical context. We have to recognize the origins, why why EU has happened, why European community was born. You all know that the European continent was the source, uh, a, a nucleus where, where, where two world war erupted and shaked the whole world. And uh, for the beginning of the European integration after the second world war, two things were conducive or critical. One was German-Franco reconciliation that led into the, you know, alliance into, into designing the future, political future of Europe. And second one was a strong backing from the United States. Unlike after the First World War, the United States stayed in Europe after the Second World War. And that made a critical difference. That was the strongest possible support to create an environment within which no future war would erupt. Uh, and that policy was relevant uh, uh, 16 so years ago, and that policy uh, is relevant e even today, uh, because uh, uh, it, it showed its relevance, especially after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, <coughs> where, in fact, uh, the United States introduced the policy of the whole free Europe and at Europe at peace. This is this was the policy that brought European Union to the to the further enlargement, and uh, and that is that the critical moment uh, that that has uh, uh, that has happened uh, 20 years or so, uh, and especially with the Big Bang enlargement in in, in 2004. Now, by, by then, the European Union had its own pace of political transformation, which more, more or less went into the deepening of its own structures with gradual, uh, with gradual uh, uh, extension uh, of its uh, member states. But what has happened in 2004 was uh, critical for the reshaping of, of, the, of the whole Europe. Uh, if uh, with 2004, as, as you know, until 2007, uh, 12 uh, new member states were joined the European Union. That means that the European Union gained about 80% of its membership, about 27% uh, in, in its territories, and about 5% in its economic output. As you see, so these figures, uh, especially, so the economic output, uh, this new enlargement brought in quite huge differences. Uh, at the time of expansion, Luxembourg had, for example, 285 percent average income. Latvia had about 47, and Slovenia had close to 90. Now, this disparity is still chasing, hunting the, the European Union because it has to, so to say, to digest uh, these differences, uh, which uh, obviously, obviously take, uh, take time. Uh, but this uh, enlargement also uh, also brought change balance of power within European Union. If uh, in early 50s, at the beginning, the ratio between small and big EU member state countries was 3 to 3, then uh, in, in 2007 this ratio was 6 to 21, 21 being small countries. And uh, it's uh, interesting then, of course, uh, uh, to see the way how now uh, European Union uh, functions. So uh, basically, 
uh, in European Union, we have always witnessed uh, two processes that went in parallel. One was the process of uh, enlargement, and w another one was the process of deepening of its, uh, in, uh, of its internal structures. And uh, this process uh, well accommodated more or less uh, expectations from all car corners and uh, was able to cope with realities uh, on, on the ground. What, uh, wh when when a uh, financial crisis uh, came from, started from the States and then to Europe, uh, and accompanying Euro crisis, then we noticed that uh, these uh, structures that EU has at its disposal does not serve sufficiently the needs of European Union to cope with, this, with these challenges. In fact, uh, this uh, crisis uh, demonstrated that uh, more bold, uh, coherent, uh, consistent political actions and decisions are, are needed within Europe to cope with uh, the financial crisis of this size that we have witnessed. Now, the, throughout the whole process of European integration, it always meant that in one or another way, its member states gave up a part of its sovereignty. And uh, the peak of this political process was achieved with so-called Lisbon Treaty, but the real financial crisis came only after the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, that, is why, uh, that, that is why EU found itself unprepared, unfitted to cope with this crisis. Because it has no instrument how to coordinate uh, fiscal management and uh, no instrument how to put uh, the, the EU uh, budgets into line uh, so that uh, so that uh, we could uh, effectively uh, address deficiencies that, that appeared in the financial sector. So what appeared as a as a as a prime challenge was to 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 adopt new rules for economic management and uh, to adopt instrument for financial regulation. Uh, instrument that will be in charge of coordination of fiscal policies. Now, to, to do that, of course, that means that these processes should lead, should lead us to a greater fiscal integration. And uh, that, that would mean that, at the end of the day, that uh, member states has to give up a part of their fiscal sovereignty. And that's, politically speaking, the critical issue. Uh, for any kind of integration, of course, it relates uh, to, to EU uh, at large. Uh, because we have witnessed already in the area of uh, 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 foreign and security policies that it's not easy for member states to, to give up uh, a part of their sovereignty. Now, but nevertheless, we have made a long way, but not long enough to deal efficiently with the financial crisis that hit the uh, Eurozone uh, so much. So to, to reach the stage where we could be able to coordinate fiscal policies, to reach the stage where we could adopt a new institutions which would lead us to greater fiscal integration, that requires a political consensus of all EU 27 member states. Uh, we are still, of course, far to achieve that. That's why now we have so-called Europe of two speeds on this particular issue. The Europe that consists of Eurozone members, Slovenia is a part of that, 17 members, and uh, uh, other EU members that still have their own currency. And uh, 
the time that we have spent now for nearly two years or one good year was time in a search for this political compromise to adopt new rules that would equip uh, European Union to deal effectively with this crisis. And it is uh, quite logical to expect that all these countries which adopted some time ago euro as a common currency, that, that they should or could be ready then to adopt also other rules of economic and fiscal management. Because when we adopted euro, then we could assume that this cannot run only uh, with the full autonomy of fiscal policies of all EU 27 member states. Of course, Euro was a political project, and that remains to be. But uh, Euro is a fact of life, so uh, if we want to preserve that, and uh, the, the cost of not preserving that would be simply uh, too high on, on that, not only uh, economists from Europe, but also economists from the United States agree that we should do everything to, to preserve Euro, uh, Euro. So there is simply no other way but progressive way. And uh, that means that we have to elevate uh, the, the, the integration process to a, to, a, to, to, a, to a higher level, and that is uh, fiscal integration. That is something that is still an issue of a divisive debate within EU. And sometimes, <clears throat> from different corners, you, we hear some criticism, you know, why we are so slow in, in, in rallying around such, a, such an agenda. Uh, my, my simple answer would be, that is uh, so crucial, so important uh, for, for the member states, for the sovereignty, that uh, it takes time to be matured. And uh, there are always, crises are always uh, opportunities really to, to embark on bold decisions. And this decision would be bold, unparalleled to maybe to, to any current decisions within, within, the, within the EU. Because as those, and, and that decision has options, of course. We can still go either way or other way. When we speak of options today that have impact on our life in the future, it's very legitimate and we should explore our options. But uh, to dwell on the options in the past, for example, that serves no purpose because when and once history is written, there are no options anymore. There are only facts on the ground. And uh, the, the, fact, the fact on the ground is now that we have European Union. We have, through our free will, opted for that. We know that that's the best for all nation states, that's the best for the US at large. Uh, and and uh, we know that uh, that serves the interest also uh, of, of the United States. United States has always uh, been uh, supportive uh, to the European integration and through the transatlantic uh, cooperation. And uh, that remains uh, critical uh, even no nowadays. Uh, although uh, we see a lot of criticism from this side of Atlantic, which uh, again are, are this criticism is based on, on, on some misperceptions or, or some impatience uh, to see uh, the, the EU process it's in its entirety. One should really never forget, never, never, never put aside the whole picture uh, what European integration from early start meant for Europe. 
that is the best possible thing that has ever happened to Europe. No other project has had such a positive impact. I would say even more. That was the that is the best project ever applied anywhere. <clears throat> if you look, of course, what are the goals and what has been achieved through European integration. We have many continents, many regions uh, in other corners uh, of the world and never we can witness, nowhere we can witness uh, uh, such a deep, politically important process as within Europe. By saying that, also, we should never lose out of our mind that European integration is a process. And our critiques, our impatience, should take that into account, that we are now only on, uh, within the one stage of this process, a critical one, but which will lead us to a further strength of the EU, EU uh, as such. Simply, we went too far to neglect that or, or to endanger that while dwelling eventually on other possible options. For Europe, there is no other option but for the European Union to progress, to strengthen its internal structures, and of course to expand further on. In terms of uh, enlargement policy, let me just say a few, few words. I mentioned to you critical juncture when this enlargement 2004 has happened, and later 2007 by inclusion of Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, then uh, the enlargement process was stalled somehow. We attribute to that some, to some fatigue within the EU, which is not strange uh, even when we, when, we, when we talk about the enlargement of NATO. We have the same kind of fatigue. But I would not over-dramatize the issue of fatigueness of these processes, because it is obvious that this uh, enlargement process cannot continue with the pace that, has, that we have witnessed in the past for one obvious reason, because the more we expand the area of enlargement, the deeper differences we embrace. So not only enlargement itself as a political goal, but the process of enlargement, the perspective of inclusion into entity as EU should be politically sufficient and interesting enough to embark countries on the path of reform that are needed to achieve full membership within the European Union. The last country that is uh, next door to the EU is now Croatia, and Croatia went through demanding and painful process of adaptation of its uh, internal structures and economy, so they are due to become full member ne next year. I'm sure it will happen. But the question is then, then what? We know that there are, there are some countries on a row waiting, and uh, in Slovenia we believe that also U.S. inspired project Europe Whole Free and Peace will not be completed until all countries of the Southeast Europe will also be a member uh, of the European Union. Of course, we know that the candidates are all Iceland and Norway, but you know this is. This is no big issue for these countries, neither for EU, if they decide to join. But uh, the issue of further enlargement in Southeast Europe, uh, that would include, uh, of course, uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Serbia, that is uh, still politically uh, at, a, at, a, at a critical juncture whether and how to, to open <coughs> the way and the path of, of uh, full inclusion. But when, when saying that, I, I want to emphasize that it is important that perspective is open and that process is open with all these stages that are necessary and that should 
fulfill also the expectations of the political elite of those countries to find sufficient political will and strength to adapt towards the, uh, the European Union acquis, which is, as I said, very demanding. Now, the issue of Turkey, of course, is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite specific. Uh, when, when I was mentioning these figures of ratio small and big and differences that are brought in through success, successive uh, enlargement uh, processes, Turkey would be a big hit uh, for the European Union, obviously. And uh, it is not sure uh, at this moment how could European Union digest a country as Turkey. Here I'm not referring to some political or cultural uh, uh, differences. Uh, but more the, to the fact that big country is a stake and uh, that European Union did not finally fully digest these 10 countries that joined uh, in, in 2004. So it is not only a political issue, but uh, it is also an issue of capacity of European Union to embrace Turkey as a new member state. Well, politically, to be uh, uh, to, to be very transparent, I must say that Slovenia supports inclusion of Turkey. Uh, even more, Slovenia supports any processes that are bringing Turkey together uh, closer to European Union, uh, and uh, that that's why. We are very much supportive for this process to be further open uh, and thus enable Turkey to, to find encouragement enough to continue the reforms that uh, are bringing uh, uh, Turkey closer to, to the European Union. Uh, so uh, from this perspective, as we see also as when it comes to the deepening of the European Union, also when it comes to its further enlargement, uh, European integration is a process in making. And uh, that's why we should, uh, uh, well, maybe sometime refrain from the degree of criticism that is attached to the European Union uh, because uh, European Union can only develop with the speed that member states are able to cope with. With the, the progress of European Union uh, integration can only be matched by the degree of a political consensus that is given from all uh, EU 27 member states. Let me, uh, in conclusion, just uh, refer shortly to to the criticism that we that we hear here in Washington and elsewhere. To which I will admit, ambassador from EU, take it very very close to the heart, uh, because uh, not because we would like to see only uh, the best, you know, uh, views on the European Union, but. Uh, but because we believe that justice is not done through these uh, uh, perceptions uh, which are to some extent also negative. We, we, we notice that also in the presidential campaign where you know that uh, language, is, uh, language is used in campaign while saying that, well, America should never follow the path of the European Union uh, as a welfare state, uh, with a welfare state economic policy. Now, uh, I have never seen anybody in Europe, not even in Washington from EU ambassadors, that would, that would nurture any kind of ambition trying to convince American friends <laughs> that welfare state is better than the system that you have. We have to respect each 
other systems that we develop. We believe that welfare state economic policy uh, suits Europe and its member states well. And uh, every, you know, right, left, or, or, or center left, or center right, or right parties, more or less, they all embrace the expectations of general population. And that is welfare state. Uh, of course, due to this uh, financial constraint that we all face now, this welfare state is under attack. But due to these constraints, not due to some departures in, in political concepts. So we should live you know, side by side with this and always be competitive. And the competitiveness, of course, is uh, tested when the voters come to the voting pools and they vote for, politi for policies of this kind or another kind. The second uh, uh, criticism uh, refers to the policy of fiscal restraint that apparently EU is applying to the degree that is not understandable here in the United States. I must admit that these critiques are well placed to a certain degree, but only to a certain degree, because as you know, the truth is not only one-sided. It's always a mix of, uh, of, uh, of one story and another story. Now, I would offer just maybe a short explanation why we, we center so much on the policy of restraint. And that, that is something that we do now as we speak in, in Slovenia. Uh, Slovenia new government embraced now the set of measures that could only be defined as a policy of restraint. Why? When it comes to national state, because you, you have to find immediate answer how to cope with the deficit that, that you have. If you spend too much over what you have earned, you have to constrain yourself. You have to bring back your, your expenditure to the, to the amount that uh, you can live with. And just now European governments are passing through their parliaments through, through the absolute majority measure, the so-called golden rule, that is that that European government would put either in the constitution or, or, a, or a high law the commitment that they could not uh, go beyond certain point of uh, deafness. So that they could not, uh, they could not uh, simply spend the money of, of the future generations. That is uh, uh, something that Germany has done and uh, we are now to adopt this golden rule as well. For for one good reason, really, not to make any government to put them in temptation to spend money that, uh, that the following generations will, will have to repay. But of course, it is also true that policy of, of restraint is not the only policy, that you have also to imply measures, incentive measures, to, uh, with, with investment in, in the economy that brings new jobs and that revives economic cycle. But when it comes to the level of European Union, uh, that there is a good reason that uh, core countries insisted on uh, uh, restrictive measures first, because simply otherwise we cannot put our house in order. And in, in absence of a common fiscal policies. This is the only way how to put uh, our, our, house, our house in order, that we, that, that we adopt rules that will commit every member state to, to reduce the budget and to cut the expenses, and only then we can talk again uh, how and where we shall spend. So I anticipate that now uh, in parallel now, in the very near future, also instruments will be applied European-wide that will uh, be seen as incentive to the economies of uh, all EU member states. And the third critique is uh, about Euroscepticism at large. Now that is uh, something that, uh, that is difficult uh, to understand. As I said, 
at given time, you always have options. You can go one way or another way. As it is true that Euro was a political motivated project, and as it is true that Euro even is nowadays a politically important project, that really not only current 70 member states, but hopefully more, are in the road to join Eurozone. It is also true that economically speaking, the European Union has no other viable option. Too much is at stake. And with globalization uh, of trade and every aspect of human life, uh, the only perspective for Euro and European Union is uh, to grow its strengths through the strengths of its institutions. And Euro is definitely one instrument that can demonstrate the capacity of the European Union to compete in world markets. Now, when I say that, it is not to the detriment of the <coughs> transatlantic relations or relations with the United States. That is something that serves the interests both of the European Union and the United States, because only strong and efficient European Union can be a viable partner to the United States. And the United States needs partner. Transatlantic relations have been de defined as an alliance of, of, of common values and shared interests, and it, it can remain this way only if EU will also be able to exercise this capacity to play a role of a strong partner. I will stop at this point. And uh, I'm open to eventual comments or questions. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned a lot of about like U.S. criticisms in your response to them. Are there any, in, like your background from Slovenia, is there any criticism of the EU that you agree with? In Slovenia, you mean? Or just you in general? I, I, I tried to pass some personal observations also on this, on this criticism. Now, uh, Slovenes, uh, I guess it's no secret for any nation, we always tend to be critical to whatever we have. But when you reach the rational point of measuring this criticism, then you have to recognize the advantages and disadvantages of certain situations. So uh, criticism could be attributed to some decisions. Even criticism could be attributed to the incapacity, for example, of the European Union to exercise more forcibly its foreign security policy, common foreign security policy. Uh, Believe me, I, I, I could argue on that lengthily because I, when I served as ambassador to UN, I saw EU at work. And 90% uh, of the work was coordinated within the EU. We spent as much time within the EU coordination processes as we did within the UN process. That was amazing. What was missing was that part that was related to the work of Security Council. And that is basically the main obstacle or detriment to the effective European common foreign security policy. Because we have still the order after the Second World War, which uh, installed five permanent members of the Security Council two of them being members of the European Union. So critiques, yes, but criticism just of the processes and so is, as we are convinced, even Slovenia in the general pools, you know, everybody admits the advantages of European integration. Sometimes there's a high cost related to that, but believe me, we have lived 
in, in, in the past hundred years we have changed six flags. Yes? And we know something about integrations. And we know that the European Union is a, let's say, safe haven for nations as, as Slovenia. Because it provides a proper framework to preserve our identity and to ensure our further development. There is always a price attached. There is no free right. Please. You mentioned that right now the ratio of big and small economies or countries in general is 6 to 21. And you also mentioned that somehow this was a German Franco project in the very beginning, like the reconciliation between Germany and France. To what extent do you think that all countries benefit in the same way? And that this is not just certain countries and the US included benefiting from the European Union more than all the other ones together? Now, uh, within the European Union, you could hardly claim that there are camps or lobby groups or alliances, if you will, that would dictate the EU policies. The alliances are ad hoc. <coughs> there are no permanent alliances. So that, that is something that we should know. On the other hand, the EU integration process is always so substantive, so, so important that needs to be fueled. This fuel can only be obtained by uh, Franco-German alliance. Uh, it could be hardly imagined that EU could progress without, maybe, maybe you know, with some other incentives we could continue, but the 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 the, the, the speed would be different. But definitely we cannot make bold decisions with them without this Franco-German engine. Uh, but of course, when, when I gave you that comparison, 21 to 6, that means that, that, you know, that European Union integration became more sophisticated because it has, to a certain degree, accommodate expectations and interest of all its members. And uh, smaller member states, by definition, they have some distinctive uh, interest to be followed. And uh, they do their best to build them into the policies of European Union. Could you tell us a little more about the Slovenian economy, please? You mentioned that at the moment of accession, um, the Baltic states had something like 40% of the GDP per capita of the European average, whereas Slovenia had 90%. If uh, you compare the economies of countries that joined EU in 2004, that is one distinction uh, between Slovenia and other Men, uh, other countries that joined EU, and and that is uh, in the amount of foreign trade that Slovenia had with market economies, with European market mainly and US, uh, before, much before joining the European Union, uh, we had we had had even in former Yugoslavia. 67% of our trade was with Western markets. Uh, unlike other countries in the East, where, where this share was minimal. So it means that uh, we had economy that was more competitive to the Western markets, and that after inclusion to EU, our main problem was not to to, to run, uh, to, to get new market share in the Western market, our, our main problem was to maintain the existing share. So obviously that, that also uh, revealed, you know, some differences in the uh, level of economic development at that starting point. Uh, now, of course, 
uh, other countries are catching up fastly, and, uh, and uh, this high percentage of Slovenia was attributed to the to the capacity in the past to to have efficient economy, while others were more socialist oriented economies. Our our business men were trained in the, in, the, in the Western market, so that brought us some competitive advantages at, at the beginning. Yeah, um, picking up on your comments about uh, bringing Southeast Europe into the European Union, uh, the general uh, model of enlargement that worked uh, when your country joined the European Union uh, in 2004 for the, for the other new member states uh, involved, uh, I think, generally elite consensus in the new member states. But we see countries in Southeast Europe where there isn't elite consensus uh, about joining the European Union, particularly those where the conflict uh, might be frozen today, Bosnia-Herzegovina, in particular, and then in Kosovo and Serbia uh, as well. Do you think uh, that the model needs any kind of uh, adaptation to those different post-conflict environments or the same basic principles and incentives uh, that worked for the other countries can also work uh, in those post-conflict countries? Well, that that would bring us much deeper into tr in, in, into understanding, you know, what are the reasons for opposing further enlargement. That's again, our answer is not very one-sided and, and simple, uh, because when I said that European Union has not finally digested all twelve countries, that means that uh, we still feel. Uh, consequences uh, of that and side effects of that. So and every notion now, uh, a part of Croatia for further enlargement is met with certain degree of resistance. Now to define the source of that resistance could bring us in different, you know, corners. Uh, uh, but uh, and and I, I I would not like to dwell with that because. If we accept uh, the notion that really what genuinely was inspired from the United States, that Europe should be whole and free and at peace, then of course we should make an effort into that. But uh, you know, the, the resistance uh, has, uh, has different roots in, in, in Europe. When you speak about Germany, well, and Austria, for them, we know why they resist so much towards any idea of getting Turkey in. Uh, when, well, well, even when, when we speak about some individual countries in the, in the Southeast Europe, you know, there is still ongoing conflict there, in fact. It's not having a violent form, but you know, the conflict hasn't been solved yet, and uh, uh, until that is done, uh, I, I think that uh, there are not very good prospects for, for some enhanced way of integration. But that's one part of the story. Now, another part of the story is that countries in question should, you know, fully embrace not only the idea of EU membership as a political inspiration, a political challenge, as a, you know, political elites always want to be challenged for something, but they should accept EU integration as a, as a political, economic, social inspiration to change their own societies. Because this is something that not everybody has fully embraced. Because you cannot only pursue political goal for the sake of implementing the goal, but you are in fact entering into the path of a deep structural changes. Now, when, when Slovenia, I was 
explain to you all the lunch that we, we had eight, at the end of 80s, Slovenia adopted a law that no law will be passed in Slovenia that will run uh, against the adopted laws in the European Union. So we volunteered already, but not for the sake of political activism, because we recognize that's the only way how to catch up the European Union and to be a part of these processes. So political elites are responsible to convince the wider population what is at their best interest, and then, of course, to pursue policies that are directed towards that. So in both sides, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, handicaps, so to say, that, that, are, that are affecting the prospects of, of a further enlargement. My question actually follows up on that, and it comes back to this issue of um, enlargement fatigue. And we had a workshop in the Balkans in, in the fall, and um, one of those visitors from Serbia said, you know, they, oftentimes it, just when you get to the next step, it, enlargement is 10 years away in the future. And I'm wondering, to what extent does the fact that, you know, enlargement, the enlargement process has slowed down and kind of the rules you know, it's Copenhagen criteria plus at this point. And at what time, at what point does that become a hindrance to um, the political elites in those countries and the wider publics getting on board, um, on, on board in terms of enlargement? Because the time horizons are just so far out um, that it's hard, um, one, for political elites who, who face election um, to campaign in favor of enlargement. Um, and then two, to bring the public along. Well, there's always price attached, no, no doubt. You cannot just gain domestically by proclaiming some you know, political goals. You have to exercise the capacity to live with your commitments and to make change happen. Now, I will just try to illustrate you to, in a way of answering you in, in, three, in three cases. That when, when, uh, when NATO enlargement, it, it, don't, don't forget, there was no EU enlargement that would not be, you know, first with NATO enlargement. So EU enlargement happened only after NATO enlargement. And this is, well, the simplest possible way to explain the importance of U.S. policy in Europe because NATO enlargement was strong political incentive to the EU enlargement. That is, that is the fact. But then, let's see Slovak, Slovak Republic. Only for the sake of their political leadership, at that time, they had delayed the process of transatlantic integration. You know, otherwise, there would be no reason. So, it was not about the capacity, it was political will expressed through political leadership. That's why political elite always hold responsibilities for what they do, how to present, how they lead the nation. The, the second one was on Croatia. Until they have delivered the war crime criminal suspect to the hate, there was no movement. And of course, there are other difficulties, but you know, just to demonstrate in one case, and if Croatia would not be, for reasons that are, of course, uh, historically maybe justified, but if they wouldn't be so involved in Bosnia and Herzegovina, with Herzegovina being, you know, inhabited by by uh, uh, Croatian uh, national population, they 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 could progress faster. So only when they had leadership that uh, embraced fully European agenda, then the path was open. So, personally, I see, I can hardly see obstacles in real terms for Serbia if they would decide that this is the policy and priority that they want to pursue. Whether there are difficulties on this road, whether there are uh, task impossible 
and missions impossible to accomplish. That's different issue, but you know, price is attached. You have to work hard. And uh, these societies really have a lot to catch up. Not only that EU is, is uh, uh, sharpening its conditionality, which is, you can, you can name it as unfortunate, but that's the fact. That only means that really that on the other side, the political elite has to exercise more courage and ability uh, to cope with, with these challenges. So uh, it is uh, really very much uh, to the elites how they define their priorities, how they present them to the public to, to gain the general support. Because, it, you know, it's not, it's not a, 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 a road to heaven, you know, because look, look other countries in Central Europe. Immediately after accession to NATO and EU, what has happened? The government were falling, you know, and the, and the so-called left parties were gaining strength again. Of course, there are negative effects, but uh, political elites should really go beyond the term of their mandate. They should be able to, you know, to, to build and create the visions that is uh, perspective uh, for their countries in, in the long run. Politicians with the vision are always needed. If uh, we would lack such politicians in Europe, we wouldn't get that far as, as we did. So one of the problems of the European integration process now is that we really lack European politicians of that caliber that we have had uh, 10 and 15 years ago. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.